everyone, and welcome to American Heat. I'm your host, Rob Willman. As a firefighter, you have all kinds of tools available to you, tools that help you through every step of the firefighting process. One of the tools you may not think about every day is smoke reading. What is that exactly? Smoke reading refers to being able to read the signs and signals that the smoke on an incident scene may be exhibiting. If you can read the signs, you can better determine what course of action you should take to suppress it safely. Let's take, for example, flashovers and backdrafts, two of the most dangerous fire conditions that firefighters face on the job. In most cases involving flashovers and backdrafts, there are signs. If these are properly read, they can be good indicators of favorable conditions for one of these potentially deadly phenomena. Today we have five objectives. First, we'll define smoke and identify its characteristics. Then we will identify the toxic hazards of smoke and its effects on the human body. We will identify smoke behavior. We will also list various smoke control or management systems that affect smoke reading. And finally, we will list some fundamental safety precautions when reading smoke. Smoke can behave differently depending on the situation. Coming up, we'll take a look at some of the influences that can affect smoke behavior. And we'll talk to some Massachusetts firefighters who have seen these dangerous conditions up close. Smoke is a part of your job every day. You may even encounter more smoke on the fire ground than you do fire. But smoke can be anything but commonplace when it comes to diagnosing a fire. What materials are burning, where the fire is located, and even what stage the fire is in. The art of smoke reading is really just a way of better understanding smoke behavior and using that understanding to make critical decisions during fire suppression operations. You can glean information from the people that are exiting the building, um, reading the smoke inside the building, but when we don't have that visual flame uh, to direct our resources, we have to use different skills to find where the fire is. And it might be a basement fire, maybe up in the attic. And that's why it's important to read the building and the smoke that's coming from uh, any of the buildings that we respond to. So before we talk about how smoke behaves under different fire conditions, let's talk about some smoke basics. Under general circumstances, a smoldering or developing fire will tend to produce large amounts of smoke due to incomplete combustion. Free burning fires will produce less smoke than smoldering fires because the combustion is complete. And a smoke filled area has a decreased percentage of oxygen and an increased temperature. Using these facts as a base, we can go on to identify the difference in smoke behavior within the confines of the building. There are many factors that can affect how smoke behaves. One of the biggest factors that can affect smoke behavior is the vast difference in building design and construction you can encounter in your jurisdiction. Depending on the structure, the way a building is constructed can restrict and influence smoke movement inside it and in some cases can totally prevent any visual signs of smoke from the exterior of the building. Building construction has changed drastically over the years. The newer buildings now that are being built are energy efficient. They're built tighter with thermal pane windows. Some cases they have triple pane glass, so the single pane glasses of, uh, from years past are no longer going to break and have a fire venting smoke being released. Building design is also rapidly changing in an effort to provide a uniform level of safety, which means that fire and smoke conditions inside them are changing as well. Building designs, codes, laws, and engineering techniques have changed over the years, making common tighter seals, a wide range of fuels within the walls, increased insulation, and better fire detection and suppression systems. Unfortunately for fire crews, increased insulation makes it harder for heat to be released from a building. Also, the rise in mixed fuel loads increases the dangers to occupants. Understand the concept of how smoke is going to act inside that building. If you're in a rural area, you are going to be dealing with residential homes. If you have a downtown city district and you're going to be dealing with high-rise buildings, the smoke will act differently. Um, commercial buildings also. So you need to fine-tune your skills for your district that you're going to be working with. Buildings with fire and smoke detection and automatic suppression systems are another factor in smoke behavior. We're being notified on an earlier um, basis than in years past where we would pull up to a building and fire would be rolling out the windows. Now we're catching that fire at an early stage of smoke. The location and type of combustion will also have an effect on not only the smoke production, but how quickly fire crews can find the fire. 
Some areas of a building, such as a basement, tend to hold smoke in versus a wide open attic space, which is more easily detectable from the outside. Walls and ceilings will play a significant role in a smoke and flame plume in a building. A one room, two room uh, versus a Victorian type house where the rooms may be 30 feet by 30 feet. It's going to take a lot longer for the energy and the smoke to build up in that room versus a standard smaller 10 by 12 bedroom uh, in a residential home. Another thing to consider is how smoke will travel in a building and what effects the smoke will play in occupant egress through doorways, exit corridors, and stairways. Our concern when we pull up is to try to prevent the fire, the smoke, and the heat from the means of egress for the occupants. So we want to leave that main egress route free of smoke, heat, and flames. Two of the most common smoke conditions found at fire operations are backdraft and flashover. To prevent either one of those from occurring, proper ventilation needs to occur. Um, it's very seldom that you'll have those cases occur when the fire has self-vented so that the heat and the smoke is um, exiting the building. When we talk about prevention of backdrafts and flashovers, what we're really talking about is proper ventilation. If properly done, ventilation is one of the best ways to prevent dangerous smoke and fire conditions like backdrafts or flashovers. With each one of those, they each have their own individual uh, telltale signs of what one will lead to the next by puffing smoke, or, you know, buildings breathing, and those are the skills that firefighters need to hone to realize which incident is about to occur and what steps can be taken to prevent that. A backdraft is a phenomenon that occurs when oxygen interacts with the confined pocket of unburned smoke and causes instantaneous combustion. The fire has come to a point where it's consumed all the available oxygen in that environment. You have a high temperature heating, you have in the smoke unburned carbon particles, aerosols, droplets contained in the smoke and that's incomplete combustion. So if essentially there's a fuel load in the smoke and what occurs is uh, the decrease in the oxygen because it's been consumed by the fire so it started to smolder and when the firefighter enters opening a door, breaking a window, that oxygen comes in and you'll have a forced um, explosion, smoke explosion if you will, and that's called a backdraft. Always begin the venting process of a building fully charged with smoke cautiously. If performed properly, it will provide an avenue for the smoke and heat to exit the building, minimizing the risk of a backdraft. Sometimes a building will actually vent on its own, or self-vent. The two main characteristics of a self-vented building to look for are a broken out window and smoke and flames emanating from that opening. Self-venting buildings have a reduced risk of backdraft conditions. On New Year's Eve of 1986, William Middlemiss and his crew responded as the second new engine to a structure fire in Lawrence, Massachusetts. The building was a three-story, six-unit balloon-style structure. The crew pulled up to the fire and began to supply the engine company with a hose line. Just then a, a child was thrown out of the third floor window. Subsequently, there were three or four children thrown out the window. While crews tended to the children, Middlemiss and two others, certain of occupants trapped inside, entered the structure without a hose line to attempt a rescue. During that rescue attempt, the crew experienced what would shortly become the precursors to a violent backdraft. I could feel the pressure change in the room, and the temperature rose dramatically. I turned around and tried to go back down that stairway, and the stairway became a chimney. The room darkened down to zero and below zero visibility. I made my way into a small pantry room, which had a sink, I believe, in there. I really couldn't tell you, but I, that's what I believe it was. And basically said, uh, um, basically at that point in time, it was, uh, it was over. Portable radios and pass alarms were not yet in use, so as a last-ditch effort to save himself, Middlemiss removed his helmet and threw it toward an area where he could see steaming occurring. The helmet didn't bounce back. It fell through an open window, hitting a firefighter and alerting them to the problem inside. I got up onto the, the, uh, 
into this little window, which was probably three feet tall, maybe 18 inches wide, and uh, managed to wedge myself out there. Tried to hold onto the windowsill as the room exploded in fire and pushed me out. As he fell 20 feet toward the ground, Middle Miss rolled into a ball, bounced off of a chain link fence, and hit the ground. He sustained second and third degree burns over 25% of his body, underwent multiple skin graft operations, and was unable to work for six months. The parents of the children thrown from the third story window perished in the fire, although all of the children survived the fall. Although backdrafts are difficult to predict with certainty, there are some characteristics you can look for that may indicate a possible backdraft. On arrival at a fire scene or at any time during operations, the building may look like it is breathing or under pressure. This is when the smoke emanates from the building in short puffs. In between each puff, fresh air is sucked back into the building. It's quite a phenomenon to watch and basically what happens is, is the uh, uh, the smoke, instead of it following its natural path, which is to go up, heat rising, it actually um, will do a reverse and it will turn around and come back down. And it almost looks like the building is breathing and you'll see it from the eaves, maybe around doors, around windows, and it's actually just like little puffs where they will puff out smoke and then suck it back in. So you know that the building's ready to go into a backdraft condition uh, and then to explode into open burning and free burning. It can be alleviated, but it takes proper ventilation practices to do it and sufficient personnel in order to accomplish the task. One of the other indicators uh, is that when smoke will turn to like a gray, yellowish smoke indication. Um, when you see that change, that's another piece that should be a telltale sign to the firefighter that a backdraft is, is probably eminent. Another characteristic of backdraft conditions is the presence of smoke-stained windows. If the windows are all blackened and will have soot on them, chances are you've had a fire that's been burning for some time and that all that carbon has adhered to the window. As crews continuously monitor the surrounding environment inside a fire building, one thing to pay attention to is excessive heat buildup. In the old days, we'd use our ears to indicate that, wow, it's getting real hot in here, or steam burns. But now with hoods and protective equipment, everything is covered and we're not sensing it. So this is one that you have to stay particularly keen on. Another concern is the lack of visible fire, which can indicate that the fire has died down because of the lack of oxygen and that high fuel vapor concentrations exist. Most of the possible backdraft indicators are visible but there is one that you can listen for. Dense smoke can actually decrease audible sounds. Smoke is, is very noise deadening, and oftentimes um, when we're entering a building, the sounds will be distorted because of the thick particles that are in the air. A flashover is defined as the near simultaneous ignition of all combustible material in an enclosed area. In a room, you have the combustibles that have reached a certain um, temperature, uh, usually it's a high temperature anywhere between 700 and I think 1200 degrees. When the enclosed environment reaches that temperature and materials in the room begin to give off flammable gases, the entire surface area of the environment is consumed by a flash flame and it's, it's probably one of the deadliest um, incidents on the fire ground is a, and people do not usually survive them. And it's very difficult because um, by the time you figure it out it's usually happening. Lieutenant James Peltier experienced two separate flashovers. During one structure fire victim search, Peltier and his crew noticed excessive heat rapidly developing, enough to melt two interior doors. He and his partner had just enough time to crouch on the ground as a flashover ignited above them. I was able to get my partner underneath me as the flame front came through and vented out the back side of the house. The line was charged immediately and uh, knocked back within seconds. I uh, received second degree burns on my shoulders, both shoulders, and my partner received first degree burns on his, on his forearm. Just like with a backdraft, there are indicators that a flashover may be imminent. However, the color of the smoke is not one of them. 
Nowadays, you can arrive on uh, residential fires, and that's pretty standard to have the black, dark, and smoke because the contents of many of the residential, even commercial buildings, have um, products that will burn hydrocarbons. The white smoke, black smoke, whatever the color is, it's still smoke, it still carries products of combustion, and it can turn deadly for the firefighter. Be aware of a room that is closed off and lacking proper oxygen. Depending on the size of the fire, the room will have to be small enough so that the fire can heat the combustible materials in the room to a temperature between 750 and 1100 degrees Fahrenheit. Flashovers in wide open areas are very rare. Another strong indicator of a pending flashover is air being sucked into an area or room. As you open the door, you're going to see that sudden sucking motion of air going in and that should be a concern so that when you open the doors, windows or whatever, stand to the side. Never stand in front of a window or a door that you're opening. That's why you open it slowly so that if you have to, you can quickly pull it shut. A sudden rapid increase in temperature can also be a predictor of a possible flashover. Any sudden spike in temperature um, where it just becomes unbearable Firefighter real needs to realize that we need to back out, and that is another telltale sign. Any one indicator is not, you know, something that you're going to say it's a definite. You need to put pieces together. Lieutenant Peltier experienced a temperature spike directly before a separate flashover during a training exercise. Because of his flashover experiences, he advocates hands-on training to recognize any signs of an impending flashover or backdraft. It is our job and unfortunately our job will kill us. So if we don't know our job, we're our own worst enemy. Which of the following is not an indicator of a fire condition that could signal a potential backdraft? A. Fire is visible. B. The building appears to breathe. C. There is a smoke color change from black to a dense gray-yellow. Or D. Smoke has stained the windows. The answer is A. Fire is visible. Just like there are many factors behind the way smoke behaves in any given situation, there are also many factors involved in the management of smoke in a structure. When a fire starts in a building equipped with a smoke management system, the movement of smoke inside will act differently because of it. Next, we'll take a look at how these smoke management systems affect smoke behavior and how you can recognize it. Smoke control and management systems are designed to control smoke dynamics within a building and also remove smoke and dangerous air. Some are designed for just normal, everyday living for air conditioning, heating, exchange. Others will be equipped with specialized equipment so that when the fire alarm system activates, additional fans and ventilation systems will be deployed to keep corridors, stairway, elevator shafts free and clear of toxic smoke and heat and gases. While a smoke management system can effectively remove smoke from the inside of a burning building, it can also be misleading to firefighters trying to locate a fire. In fact, it could prevent crews outside from seeing the smoke at all, or it could send interior crews in the wrong direction. Mechanical ventilation systems can play, if you will, tricks on firefighters, and that's why it's important that the firefighter know his district, see the newer buildings that are being built, especially plan review and code review, realize that the newer equipment that are out there, and there's many types. When it comes to reading smoke, firefighters should never rely on any single one observation. You have to look at all the symptoms, don't just take one. It's just like looking at the blood pressure of a patient. You don't want to look at just the blood pressure. You've got to look at the pulse and you have to look at the respiration. So you have to do all of that, and it's the same thing with the fire. Just because there wasn't gray smoke or green smoke doesn't mean it's not going to happen. It just means that somebody else had a different overstuffed chair in that room that burns a little differently. So you need to know the total package of signs and symptoms and why and how it happens. Because of the great number of different types of systems out there, it's important to keep in mind that you can never rely 100% on the smoke control system. Firefighters should be aware of the kinds of variables associated with smoke management systems that could affect the behavior of smoke. Smoke and heat control in larger buildings will be affected by pressurization in the building. Pressurization can be created by mechanical means, 
as in a smoke removal or ventilation system, or by natural means such as the weather, temperature, or barometric pressure. There are several effects that the combination of pressure, smoke, and heat can have within a building. The first one we'll talk about is smoke feedback. When a large amount of smoke or heat activates a building's ventilation system, some of the smoke is taken out through the air exhaust vents. But that smoke may be exiting an area that has now a opening that will actually take that smoke back in. And it's almost like recycling the smoke and it's putting the smoke back into the building. So you can have, a, in a sense, the, the smoke removal system working against you. Smoke feedback, or smoke re-entering the air supply, is one of the primary reasons firefighters misread the smoke in a building, often throwing them off from the real fire location. Another phenomenon with the potential for misleading fire crews is called the stack effect. This can happen in taller buildings where the inside air temperature is significantly different than the outside air temperature. And what will happen is the difference in the temperature from outside and inside will actually take and drive the smoke and the superheated gases up to the top floors. So that's called a stack effect when the smoke is pushed up through the center of the building or through the, the open alleys. Another effect firefighters can look for is that of smoke moving laterally across a neutral plane. During a building fire, smoke and heat will rise from the side of the fire. As the smoke and heat rise, cool air from above the fire area is forced down. The space in between the cool air and the hot air is called the neutral plane, and it can fluctuate up or down depending on changes in the temperature, wind, and humidity. When the smoke hits this space, it will actually mushroom out laterally instead of rising through it. The neutral plane effect can also happen in larger hotels, apartments, office, and high-rise buildings. Some larger buildings will have a floor area smoke control system, which can create something called a pressure sandwich. The pressure sandwich is basically the movement of pressure throughout the building as the fire and smoke conditions progress. What happens is the fire in the affected area creates negative pressure, while positive pressure starts to build in the unaffected areas. So the top, bottom sides will take and sandwich and push the good air into the bad or the affected area, pushing all the heat and the smoke out of the rest of the building so that, again, keeping the means of egress open for people that are exiting the building. Depending on the system, the elevator systems and stairwells may be pressurized. A pressure sandwich can affect many things. How fire crews read the smoke, any occupants escaping the area, and the tactics and operation of the suppression force. There are a few more things that firefighters should be aware of when it comes to smoke behavior. Propeller fans can actually affect smoke movement inside a building. If a fan doesn't have a proper windshield or is on the leeward walls or roof, the wind pressure may not allow the exhaust air to exit the system. Smoke reading of basement fires can be challenging. With a basement fire, it's typically below ground. So what we normally find is that the temperature in the basements are much cooler than the upper floors. You'll have a colder smoke and it doesn't tend to rise because it's going to take so much more energy from the fire, the heat, to raise the temperature in that room. We have to force the ventilation to get down there and find out what's burning. Another factor in any mechanical or natural system that needs to be considered is windows and doors that have been left open. When you leave that front door open, that gives it a free air to let the fire grow. So doors will play a role. You'll see it in commercial buildings where they'll have automatic door closes. And that's why when the fire alarm activates, they'll have all the interior doors close um, to prevent the smoke and the superheated gases. With all the elements out there that can affect smoke behavior, it doesn't make sense to rely completely on the smoke management system installed in the fire building. When we're walking into a building and we don't know how to operate it, it, it can turn around and be a double-edged sword. It can work against us if not properly used. You're fighting a fire in a tall building and the temperature outside is very cold. This temperature difference will likely create a situation inside the building where smoke and heat are trapped by the upper floors. This is called A, the layer effect, B, a smoke pancake, C, a stack effect, or D, a smoke sandwich. The answer is C, a stack effect. 
Now that we've gone over the way smoke behaves and how smoke and fire management systems affect that already complex behavior, let's take a look at some safety precautions you can keep in mind when it comes to dealing with different kinds of smoke conditions. The art of smoke reading or reading the signs and signals that the smoke on an incident scene may be exhibiting is really about safety on the fire ground. While reading the smoke produced at a fire can provide a wealth of insightful information, there is still room for misinterpretation. With as many factors as there are that can affect smoke, it can be misleading and misinterpreted. That means there are significant safety issues out there for firefighters and occupants. The information gleaned by firefighters on site should be considered only one small piece of the larger puzzle of the fire ground. And this information should be constantly monitored and updated. It's all of these items that you have to take a look at and, and put into play as you're, uh, you're moving in. But ultimately what it comes down to is firefighter safety. The fire ground is a fluid environment and needs constant monitoring. This observation needs to be throughout the whole incident. It doesn't just happen as soon as you get off the rig and you stretch in the line. 10, 15, 20 minutes into the operation, has things changed? Has the environment, the temperature increased, the smoke, the flame? What is changing in that environment? Are you making any headway? And these are things right through till when you put the hose back on the fire truck. Pay special attention to clues that indicate the possibility for dangerous conditions within the building and clues that might indicate when suppression crews need to be withdrawn. The idea is to be able to recognize when it is no longer safe inside the building. We want to make sure that everybody that comes in on their shift goes home from their shift. And the only way is, is everybody to be aware of their surroundings. Another safety concern based on smoke behavior is that the exact location of a fire cannot be determined based upon the location of the smoke exiting the building. Smoke can travel great distances within a building, providing a false sense of the fire location. Remember that smoke color is not a reliable or singular indicator as to what is burning. The more common colors of smoke are black, brown, gray, and white. Concern should be given to unusually colored smoke, like orange, green, or blue. Sudden changes in color, volume, and density of the smoke should also be of concern. Smoke's temperature will make a difference in how it behaves. For example, one concern is cool smoke. This is smoke that has traveled a great distance and may have lost a significant amount of heat. It's a heavy, thick smoke versus it rising up to the upper floors. You don't have that heat to travel up. So you'll have a lazy, cold smoke. And that can be just as dangerous as the superheated smoke. Low-lying or cool smoke conditions can provide a false sense of what is burning or misleading idea of the fire location. One last safety concern is the furnishings and contents of the buildings. In recent years, there has been a rise in popularity of furnishings that use synthetic fibers, such as polyester. This has changed what the smoke looks like as these materials burn. The number of concerns regarding smoke behavior may seem like a lot to try and remember in a real fire emergency, but the basic idea behind the art of smoke reading is really just safety for you and your crew, no matter what your rank. It's your responsibility and everybody else's responsibility on the fire ground to watch and monitor constantly the environment that you're going into to prevent a flash over a backdraft. It's going to save you, it's going to save somebody else, and it's very important that you fine tune your skills when dealing with an environment that you're entering into. True or false? The exact location of a fire within a building can be determined by the location of the smoke 